Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Genesis Block. So today we're going to be walking through another protocol analysis uh, after the ones that we've done on Toki Mac and Ocean Protocol. Uh, so today we're going to be going through Dystopia Swap and Yash is going to present the analysis that he's done on Dystopia Swap where we're going to understand how the protocol works, what it's about, um, you know, what its performance has been and critically assess it. So uh, without any further ado, I'll just hand it over to Yash. Right. Hi, guys. So uh, Dystopia Swap is a new DEX that's been built on uh, Polygon or Matic, as you may all know of. Uh, so what Dystopia Swap is trying to do, if I can just summarize right in the beginning, is they are trying to be the curve finance of the Polygon ecosystem. Uh, curve, as you know, is one of the biggest DeFi protocols out there, and it's facilitated billions uh, in trading volumes for stable swaps. And Dystopia Swap is trying to do the exact same thing for the Polygon ecosystem, but they have also improved upon the the curve, you know, the V curve model that Curve Finance currently uses, and made it something a little different. Um, I wouldn't say it's revolutionary technology; it's just a improvement on something that was already great token design. So, uh, the way the Dystopia Swap team describes it is a V three three complete. Uh, Dex and V three three, as you know, was uh made by Andre Cronier, the founder of Phantom, and also Solidly, the Dex built on top of Phantom. And Solidly was a also a Dex that tried to incorporate the V token model and uh, also create a seamless experience on the on Phantom for you know exchanging different types of assets. Uh, and he was the one who popular popularized this idea of the V three three model where different network participants can all work and coordinate together to achieve a shared goal was his basic thesis, no matter how different their uh, objectives or their stakes in the project are. Um, right. So before we proceed, do you guys want to say anything about, you know, the V3C model or any of the uh, original models that you all may have heard of and, yeah. you know, what do you all think about them? I think it might be helpful if you could quickly go over what the V token model is and then what the V33 <laughs> model is and like right. what the and what the divergence between those two models are and and you know what it what what right. the overall implications are. Right. So uh as you may all know in the DeFi summer of 2020, something that really spurred uh, the growth of DeFi was something called liquidity mining, wherein uh if you uh as a liquidity provider deposit liquidity into some kind of protocol you are rewarded with protocol governance tokens depending on this you know the amount of liquidity you pull put in and basically what this led to was you know lots of mercenary capital because people would just deposit more liquidity into a protocol for the initial yield that they were getting in the form of governance tokens and when that yield kind of dissipated and they saw better yield elsewhere problem in crypto was that how do you make liquidity stick around and I think Curve was the first one that thought of the V token model, which was really revolutionary, wherein uh, you provide liquidity, you're rewarded with Curve tokens. But if you lock up your Curve, you get V Curve, uh, which is basically means vote is screwed Curve. And that V Curve gives you, uh, it gives you different things. It gives you, you know, governance uh, rights over um, you know, the Curve ecosystem. It gives you the right to boost rewards into a pool that, you have provided liquidity to or you want uh you know boosted curve rewards to and it also gives you a cut of the swap fees that happens in a liquidity pool that you voted for oh and in that period lots of people realize that curve is a very valuable asset because you can lock it up as v curve and boost rewards uh to your pools continuously earn more curve and earn trading fees as well and it finally gave people a reason to you know stick around and uh, let that uh, liquidity be sticky. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, to get V curve, you have to lock up your curve for certain periods of time. And the max lockup was four years for which you would get the max amount of V curve, right? So that's the history of the V token model. Um, and it is basically a new way that, uh, you know, was really revolutionary in DeFi to help liquidity stick around. 
right? So dystopia swap works on uh, a similar model. Uh, and I can go ahead with explaining exactly how it works, you know, after you guys share your co comments on everything I just said. Okay, uh, should I go first? Um, go for it. Yeah, yeah, go on. So, I mean, <clears throat> I, I don't have much to comment on the difference between a V and VC3, but what I do want to um, clarify is more on the need for another DEX, right? Um, which is equally as important as we're talking about dystopia swap. Um, so from what I understand is the end goal for any, any ex de decentralized exchange is to optimize for uh, deep liquidity, correct? And then therefore reduce, re reduce slippage um, for trades. That's like the end goal for any right. tech. And the only way they can do it is via one, um, you know, a superior technology. So instead of order book, go to an AMM, for example. Um, and the other way is via their token office. Um, is that is that broadly correct? Is there something I'm missing? No, that's uh, that's yeah, that is correct. So the point of any DEX is to uh, provide as much liquidity as possible, and yeah, the, you know, lowest trading fee uh, fees for traders and as low slippage as possible. And that's only possible uh, when there's enough liquidity that sticks around long term. So the problem that DEXs are still figuring out or haven't figured out yet is how to ensure through their native governance token that they can make liquidity stick around. You know, so for Uniswap, um, it's probably the hopes that in the future, the Uniswap, uh, you know, the Uniswap DAO would mm -hmm. finally activate that fee switch and start taking a cut of, you know, trading fees instead of LPs, you know, getting all of it. Or with Curve Finance, it's the whole Curve and V Curve model. So it's different models on different DEXs to basically provide the best liquidity possible. And I think like DeFi has finally matured enough to realize or kind of figure out the general direction of what is the best model out there. And Dystopia Swap is just another iteration in that attempt. And the point of this is to discuss whether we think it can succeed given what it is, or at least makes sense, you know. Got it. So in general, if it's built on um, Polygon, right? Like what are the, like, is it the, what are the different types of competitors it's got currently? Because I mean, th uh, just stepping back and looking at it from a bit of a higher level, um, if they've got quite a lot of competition, um, me, not only on Polygon, but all across the Ethereum ecosystem, because of the way that these, you know, um, you know, these rollups and side chains, uh, it, it, how they communicate and how they, how they essentially are all part of the ecosystem. Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so if they've got quite a lot of competition from existing DEXs, including Uniswap, which is by far and large the biggest DEX across uh, DeFi, why, um, why, why is it that, you know, Dystopia Swap is going to grab the market share of these myriad uh, different types of DEXs all across the ecosystem? And, um, and is its tokenomics and the model that it's trying to get these customers with trying to get users with, is that sustainable? And does it, in, does it essentially, but even, even though, you know, it can get past the cold start problem, which is essentially garnering enough users, um, in the initial phase of its launch, um, does the tokenomics that it has and other use cases that are, you know, served by dystopia swap and the efficiencies that it, it makes, are those enough? to keep users, um, you know, on the platform, uh, you know, like keep uh, to, to essentially maintain the network effect that they have, or can the model that they have, can it be, you know, forked and then tweaked by an exchange that currently, you know, is in the lead. And um, if so, then, you know, what is the, you know, what's essentially the USP that, uh, that dystopia swap is going to ha have it now and over the, you know, um, over the near future to be actually able to hold on to the users that they have? Right. So, I mean, that was a very packed question. And I feel like we can, you know, unpack it by kind of okay. discussing how Dystopia Swap works and, you know, going through the entire kind of the, the way they have designed the incentives around the protocol. So, uh, so let's start. So basically, there are two different stakeholders in the Dystopia Swap ecosystem. 
uh, on the one hand, we have liquidity providers who, uh, you know, for different token pairs, you know, for, you know, so Matic, ETH, we have different token pairs, you'll have different liquidity providers. Uh, and then, um, and then there's obviously this token holders. So dystopia has its own native governance token called dist and dist holders can like, you know, the curve model dist holders can swap their dist for VDist. And VDist is essentially the governance token of the dystopia swap ecosystem. And uh, VDist is non-transferable, not tra non-tradable, just like V curve and can only be created by, um, um, depositing this into the protocol, right? So the way the flywheel works, the way they've designed it is that um, dystopia holders can deposit it into the protocol and get VDIST. VDIST holders receive 100% of swap or trading fees from the liquidity pool uh, that they have uh, voted for. And uh, essentially what the VDIST holder is voting for is which pool uh, should get emissions of more disk, right? And then liquidity providers get 90% of that disk and the remaining 10% goes to the V disk holder. So now I know that was a lot to kind of unpack um, and you guys can maybe ask me questions too so that you can, you know, you and the uh, listeners can figure out exactly what I meant by all of that. Yeah. So um, just to just to recap that, right? Um, and tell me if I'm uh, if I've summarized it correctly. But essentially, um, there are dist holders. The if they if the dist holders lock up their dist, they get v dist. Uh, the v dist holders then um, are able to vote on where the dist emissions that are granted as rewards for providing liquidity to liquidity to holders are directed. So if there's like a liquidity pool of, let's say that ETH and, um, you know, Matic, uh, Matic, and then there's a, then there's a dis, uh, liquidity pool of Matic and, um, you know, another token, right? And if they, if they vote on liquidity pool two, if most people vote on liquidity pool two, then most emissions will go towards that pool and P and the V dist holders are incentivized to vote for the pool, which has the highest trading volume because they get hundred percent of the trading fees, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. I think I get that. And just taking that a step further. And I, I think that this is a point that you're going to in, inevitably touch upon, but, um, so essentially the liquidity providers, they only get the disc. So what they are incentivized to do with that disc is to lock it up. Right. 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 And, and, and therefore and, become right. the disc holders and. And the liquidity right. can then be, and they can di therefore direct liquidity liquidity most efficiently to their own right. pools. So if you're a liquidity provider and you uh, use your VDIST NFT at the time where you're um, getting your rewards, uh, or sorry, when you're choosing uh, uh, what to do with your rewards, you can lock up your DIST as VDIST as a liquidity provider and then get a boost, right? So that boost is what incentivizes a liquidity provider to lock up his emissions that he's gotten previously for the next cycle. Okay. Right. So what you want is as much of your disk locked up because that is good for the supply dynamics and the price of disk, right? And more, more disk locked up means, you know, less out there for, and if there's an increase in demand that automatically leads to an increase in price. And, and right? you, so, yeah. And you mentioned a V disk NFT. So, you know, right. like, uh, just, just to touch upon the NFT aspect of this. So, um, so, so do you want to like quickly go through that? And then I can ask a question. Right. So in the, in, in curve, you know, it's curve and there's V curve. They are both, you know, ERC 20 tokens in this, the, when you lock up your disc, you get a V disc NFT. Okay. And that V disc NFT is essentially a locked position that has a bunch of kind of V it has a V V disk token balance and you can use that V disk NFT to vote on different pools, uh, you know, up to the balance that you have. So let's say you have a balance of hundred in your V disk NFT, you can vote on it in three different pools and you don't have to just commit like on, unlike curve, but you have to commit all of your V curve to one pool. You can kind of split your position amongst multiple pools, but at the same time, they, they do want people, if you, you know, lock up your VDIS NFT into one pool, that also gives you another secondary boost. 
So what they're trying to do is make sure that people are very efficient about using their VDIS and that they, you know, don't just split it up to kind of diversify their risk. They choose the liquidity or they choose the pools that they want to get the emissions very low, you know, logically in a way. Okay. So um, I just have a follow up on that. I, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure why if I understood the reason behind picking an NFT versus, you know, just going out, going ahead with another token that proves your deposit. Um, is there, is there, uh, you know, is there any particular reason they've gone for this or? Um, I mean, from, from what I understood, I don't think it makes too much of a design difference because the concept is still the same where you have a locked up V token that gives you governance and, you know, right to trading fees, right? It's very similar to Curve. So I'm not sure exactly why they went for uh, V NFTs. Uh, but the only reason I can think of is something we haven't spoken about yet, which is the way the uh, DIS tokens were initially uh, distributed to the to the people they wanted to distribute the tokens to, right? So basically, uh, now we're kind of segueing into what I wanted to talk about anyway, uh, which is that this Dystopia Swap wants to be the you know the best DEX on Polygon, right? And to do that, they need app different dApps in the Polygon ecosystem to kind of be incentivized to provide liquidity on this DEX as compared to other DEXs on the Polygon ecosystem. So what the Dystopia Swap team has done is that they have firstly they have airdropped uh, fifty five percent of the initial supply to the Polygon DAO. Uh, the Polygon DAO is currently run by six different signatories. It's a multi sig wallet that needs four of the six to kind of do anything. Uh, and the rest of the tokens have been split up uh, amongst different da 26 different dApps on the Polygon ecosystem, right? So it's targeted airdrops to the Polygon DAO, which has got a majority. Uh, and it's also given uh, a minority to 26 different dApps that they think uh, are like helpful in building the Polygon ecosystem out more. So they've given the Polygon DAO this much power because they believe and maybe rightfully so that the Polygon ecosystem would, you know, vote on pools correctly because dystopia swap success would lead to the Polygon ecosystem succeeding more in general, right? Because if there's one place where there's deep liquidity uh, and there's incentive for that liquidity to stick around long term, you can really build a DEX unlike any other. And it can, you know, if it's in, if it's uh, incentives are designed better than any DEX on the Polygon ecosystem, there's no reason why DApps would not shift their liquidity from other DEXs onto this DEX, right? Yeah. So a question that I have: So did they do this in con in conjunction with Polygon? So did they tell them, "Oh, here Polygon DAO, we're gonna give you fifty five percent of our initial supply. This is what we want you to do over the longer term, which is vote right. on the correct pools to do it." Or did they just give it to them because the because, no? So the yeah. the the Polygon ecosystem is really, really interlinked and projects kind of build together, even though it seems like they're separate projects, they're all kind of under the same umbrella, right? Because um, so Ethereum itself doesn't really have a DAO, right? So if you want to build an Ethereum, you kind of can, and you can do that yourself. But if you build in the Polygon ecosystem, there is a bunch of people who will be willing to help you if you have the right idea. So the, dystop the team that built Dystopia Swap is called the tattoo team and the tattoo team is part of the polygon council which is a a group of different dapps that have uh, come together uh, and the you know the initial dap that started this polygon council is called sphere which is one of the premier staking platforms on polygon so as you can see it's like all very interlinked so dystopia swap was i'm sure there was input from all over the polygon dao as to how they should and who they should give the initial airdrop to Okay. And like the benefit of using Polygon DAO is obviously like they are a credibly neutral party because yeah, and, exactly. and they want the overall ecosystem to succeed. So even if there are, you know, theoretically 10 DEXs doing the same exact thing um, that Dystopia Swap is doing, the Polygon DAO would be incentivized to give, to, to vote for the correct pools in each of those 10 DEXs anyway. Because right. they, because they just want to gain as much liquidity as possible uh, for the entire ecosystem and as many dApps on the ecosystem as possible. Right, exactly. So I mean, and that is why they they 
they didn't they don't have v curve or oh, sorry v disc tokens they that's because they they airdropped v nfts to all of these different stakeholders and then these different stakeholders would be in charge of the emissions that happen throughout the life life cycle of the protocol and and each of these different v nft tokens that were airdropped have different balances on them so right um, so the way they've yeah. done it is you know 55% of the polygon ecosystem dao uh, and then i think they have for well, if i'm not wrong it's 4% and 2% for frax and uh, key dao which is uh, you know the creator of the mai stable coin which is like dai but on you know polygon and then the rest is uh, distributed between uh, 26 different dapps equally mm -hmm. So I mean, Frax is a stable coin, and Mai is also a stable coin. So they've given them a higher share because you need, you know, stable coin liquidity in any kind of dex because that's a unit of account. Uh, the Polygon ecosystem got a got a huge chunk of it, but theirs is locked as a VNFT for a max of four years. So all they can do is direct who gets emissions, and they will be rewarded with trading fees. And the way they've designed it is that the trading fees that go to the Polygon DAO NFT, the one they got airdrop, will be used for grants uh, further in the Polygon ecosystem. So it's kind of it. It's in the interest of the Polygon DAO to act correctly to maximize the amount of trading fees they get from the NFT, which they can then use for their own, you know, for their own ecosystem to grow even more. But it's still up to them, right? It's this is the ideal. I mean, yeah, it is. It is up to them, but that's. That's where you'd hope that yeah. they are interested in their own creation doing well in the future also. Yeah. And I think also the 55%, like the majority stake to Polygon DAO serves almost as an incentive for them to focus on Dystopia Swap to be the main dex. Exactly. I, I mean, I'm sure, like, I mean, I can't say 100% for sure. It's not like I know. I don't have proof. But I would assume that the Polygon ecosystem DAO was part of this decision yeah right because the dystopia swap team is not they aren't getting they aren't getting anything themselves in the initial token distribution there's nothing allocated to a team and there's nothing allocated to investors it's literally been made just so the mm -hmm. polygon ecosystem has the best place for exchanging different assets so, which i think is kind of yeah. crazy if you think about it so a couple of different things, right? So I think that that makes sense overall, but, but also, you know, if there was another DEX that rocked up tomorrow and went to the Polygon ecosystem and said, we're going to, we're going to rip off the exact same model that Dystopia Swap is doing. And, uh, you know, and, you know, maybe tweak it a little bit just to be a little, a little more, you know, different and then go to, uh, the Polygon ecosystem down and say, oh, we're going to give you 55% of the tokens. You're going to have to direct the emissions for us for this. They're not going to say no. So, I mean, like, yeah, like to a certain point, obviously they'll want dystopia swap to do well, but, 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 you know, um, also as like a neutral party, theoretically, they should not be, you know, pumping for one dex over another, but obviously it depends on the liquidity, right? It depends on how, how much time passes between now and when the new dex theoretically um, comes up, right? Because if already and I think the Polygon ecosystem is a little more collaborative than that because I mean, so there's a certain amount of there's only a limited amount of developers who are working in the Polygon ecosystem, right? And I would assume that most of them know each other because the Polygon ecosystem is very open like that, and they do try to take as many people under the umbrella as possible. So if you know that one team is building something, you are not gonna you know you're not going to go and screw them over and create the same thing with just a few tweaks because that would go against the whole ethos of what Polygon's trying to do. Okay. So yeah, it is a possibility, of course, that someone will just fork it and you know try to do the same thing. But mm -hmm. I'm sure that Dystopia Swap was made with all of these people as part of the in you know as part of the decision making process. So I I don't think anyone else could just come in and do the same thing, and all of these people would be just be okay with it. Okay. And now it would yeah. just wouldn't make sense. Fair enough. I mean, it's a good. It's a it's a fair assumption. Um, and another question that I had, so you said, you know, they're not giving any allocation to investors. So how have they raised the funds to be able to build this? Is it through Polygon grants or something or? Yeah. So they raised it to Polygon grants and the tattoo team, they have their own protocol called tattoo. So I, I haven't read into tattoo too much, just that it's a, it's like a multi, um, chain, uh, 
wallet aggregator type thing or multi-chain asset management service that's built on top of Polygon. So I think I think they probably made their money from there and now this is just a kind of a public service they're doing to the entire Polygon ecosystem. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'm it sounds, it sounds, sounds fishy. I agree with you. I'm not I'm sure. I mean, I look skeptical about, you know, I mean, the I, tattoo team yeah. isn't, is not docs, but I mean, there's clearly no allocation to any investors and team, right? You, it's all yeah. open and you can see who they've allocated to. So there is no way, there's no incentive for them to rug pull because they have nothing to rug pull. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, for most part, that makes sense. I think that like, if they are part of the Polygon council and they get the allocation as one of the multi-sig holders on the DAO, then I think that's a bit yeah. of an incentive. Um, uh, but also I think that that might be, I mean, obviously like I'm not going to be, you know, sitting here and making these judgments without knowing what's actually true. So, you know, that's a possibility. Um, but that's just my risk averse side just coming into play. Yeah. yeah, and that's fair enough. And, you know, after all the collapses we've seen, it's, it's, I think it's good to be a bit cynical and, you know, question every single thing down to the last detail because, I mean, honestly, there is no pro- perfect protocol out there, right? And there will be something or the other that will turn you off by. It's just about whether you believe that. I, I think the best way to analyze dystopia swap is the core, core tokenomics because that is what I feel is, you know, immune to any kind of, outside interference if the core tokenomics are solid then people will always come to provide liquidity on this swap no matter what okay so why don't we go over that a little bit then um right the tokenomics. Sure. right 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 so basically so like we discussed this to this to uh this can be locked up for v in the future once you know all these nfts unlock and there's you know more v more disc circulating out there in the market you can lock up your disc for v dist and then on your VDIST, you can earn trading fees on whatever uh, liquidity pool, you know, you choose to vote for. So you'll, you'll basically, you'll vote uh, for a specific pool. The liquidity provider will get all the emissions that the pool uh, deserves based, based on the amount of votes it gets. And then you get all the trading fees from that pool. So as a VDIST holder, you are incentivized to vote for the pool with the maximum trading volume and that kind of cre- creates a flywheel effect where liquidity providers want to provide liquidity in the deepest pools because those pools will be voted upon by weedest holders because they have the highest volume and hence the highest trading fee so it becomes a win-win for both of them uh, so the crux of this is that it's it's actually the liquidity providers who decide what they want to do with all the dist emissions they've got right because they get 90 percent of all dist emissions and uh you know we we dist holders get 10 percent of it so if liquidity providers one day decide that you know i can get a better deal somewhere else and they take their liquidity away and they just sell off their disc that could maybe lead to some kind of sell-off where you know one big liquidity provider leaves another does another does and suddenly mm liquidity is dried up and all of that dist gets unlocked and sold in an instant and that would just lead to you know like the price just absolutely crashing but at the same time there's also positive flywheel effects that you can see right now happening where uh which is exactly what i just explained because it all becomes kind of circular because the more trading the more trading volume the more trading fees so the weedest holder will vote for that pool um, and that pool will get more emissions, which means liquidity providers want to provide more liquidity in that pool to get a big chunk of those emissions. And then the last thing that ties all of this together is that if you're a liquidity provider and you're a VDIST holder, you can boost the rewards on the pool that you, you voted for. So Curve has a similar thing where you can boost your rewards. So this is very similar to that, uh, where you can do a 2.5 times boost if you do both things. So what they're trying to do is incentivize people to provide liquidity and then lock up those disk tokens for VDIS. So that is good in two ways because, you know, you're getting in more liquidity and then your disk token at the same time is getting locked up for VDIS and not getting sold. And that kind of controls the supply, the circulating supply of disk out there. And if there's an increased demand for DIST, which there might be because DIST gives you VDIS and VDIS gives you trading fees, then the price of DIST will increase over time, theoretically. So 
what where does the value accrue in dist um because the only thing that i can get from this is that value only accrues to dist through locking it up and getting v dist yeah but v dist is not something that's tradable right so if you want any kind of exposure to the trading fees you have to buy and own dist and yeah, convert then, that into v dist yeah but if you okay so let's think about it this way i want access to the trading fees so i have to get dist and then convert it into v dist right um yeah. and the only the only way that i get this is if like for example um there's you know uh from the emissions that are granted to the liquidity providers um with uh, the emissions that are granted to liquidity providers are then sold on the open market and then some i can buy some of that dist and then i convert it into v dist and i get exposure yeah. uh, to the trading fees but okay like think about a think about a situation in which volume um on trading fees is actually lower and i am a v dist holder and i want liquidity right and and the thing is that um if like you can have a negative flywheel effect because of if, course yeah, yeah be- exactly. because the thing is that if trading fees are lower then and i don't have liquidity um to remove my v dist firstly i'm not going to like use too much of my dist to like lock it up so i'm just going to sell up uh, sell off more of uh, you know all the dist that i get through current emissions so that's already putting sell pressure then secondly um when i uh, i won't be incentivized enough to actually vote on the correct emissions because i'm not really getting high trading fees so then you get into a situation in which there's a bit of a spiral in which there's um not enough vdist that's been locked up that's correctly voting yeah. for the right liquidity pools so that means you don't get that means the amount the, the amount of it becomes like a loop again but in the opposite yeah. direction where there's not it enough does. trading fees and all of those kind of thing and then after you know all that vdist becomes unlocked it'll just get sold because there's not enough activity going on in the platform right, right. so um and and if the only the only benefit of dist is to um you know if the only benefit of dist is to convert it to vdist and hold it then i feel like that's a problem with the that's a bit of a problem with the model itself because the to- because the token itself like the, there's no actual value to the token all you get from the token is access to the trading fees and if the trading fees are low and if they can't bootstrap activity to the platform then the trading fees are consistently going to stay low and how do you jump start that then like how do you like how do you make sure that there's enough liquidity right. ongoing and i and that's what i think that my problem with the entire model is like the tokenomics may seem good when like the going is you know uh, when, when like the grass is green and the and the sky is blue and the birds are chirping but then when you know you uh, you know you get into a situation where there's none of that happening and you're in a bear market and a recession and people don't want to do all this trading and they want to hold on to their assets then you're not going to get any trading fees and then the vdist holders are not going to be able to get rid of the uh, rid of their tokens and that just creates a negative spiral yeah i mean that's very that's very possible obviously but i mean the same the i mean curve kind of uses the same token design right what like curve intrinsically has no value itself also right like what curve itself accrues no value as a curve token holder if i just buy curve on an exchange i am not going to va- accrue any value other than you know speculation on the curve token right i need to take that curve and lock it up as v curve to get you know governance plus trading fees which is very similar to what v dist the, and dist also kind of is right the difference for me would be that firstly curve i don't think a lot of people actually I think a lot of DAOs will have curve. I think a lot of DAOs may have dist. The individual people are not really going to hold these tokens that much. Yeah, of course not. Like, this is exactly. for DAOs. So this is for DAOs, right? So that's like like that that's cleared out. That's good. But the second thing is that there will be more volume of uh there will be more volume going on in curve than there is volume going on in dist naturally because. curve is geared towards stable assets and stable coins and even in recessions trading of stable coins and 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 in, in like recessions and bear markets the trading and volume of stable coins should not decrease as much as it does for other tokens which are more risk on right okay so that's another thing i forgot to mention so dystopia swap has been designed in such a way that so the way tokens get listed is that they have to get white listed by uh, by someone who has a greater than 20% so uh, so like supply of the total circulating supply out there so right now when that has started that is only the polygon dao who has that much 
uh, has that much of a supply. So they are the only ones who can whitelist tokens. So they will only whitelist tokens that they think can grow the Polygon ecosystem in general, right? Because that is how they benefit because they want the maximum amount of trading fees because that is what they are going to get from the VNFT after it unlocks, right? So the 26 different dApps that they have chosen are obviously integral to the Polygon ecosystem. And initially by kind of bootstrapping that growth by airdropping this to all these different stakeholders, they are trying to kickstart that flywheel effect and hope that enough, uh, you know, there's enough traction and uh, enough of, you know, positive network effects where all these guys will stick around and not actually sell their, you know, once the unlock is over, sell their VDIS for this and just cash out. They are hoping that these guys stick around for a long time, build liquidity because the Polygon ecosystem is supporting these guys to do so. Yeah, I mean, I think that that makes... Th- that makes sense to a certain level, but also you kind of have a situation in which firstly you're beholden to the dist. Um, I don't know if there's a dystopia swap DAO or whatever, um, but you're, you're, you're beholden to the governance of the dystopia swap protocol deciding on which tokens are worthy of being whitelisted or not. Um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, sorry, that went on mute, but that's kind of a problem because um, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow trustless addition of tokens to a DEX, which is what a DEX kind of is usually about, but that's fine because you don't need to like adhere to what's, you know, what a DEX is usually about at, at, at every stage anyway. But there's obviously like situations in which, you know, if you go up, if you go to the, uh, go to a dystopia swap and say, you know, I want my token included and they, you know, arbitrarily decide whether that token is included or not. Like that's, I, I mean, like, I don't, I don't think I necessarily, you know, um, love that idea. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, I, I, I think that that kind of makes sense in terms of like, in terms of how you would at least scale and grow slower and bootstrap liquidity, um, over the longer term. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a trade-off that, you know, we have to, that, that, that you keep in mind. Yeah, it's definitely a trade-off. There's quite obviously an inherent centralization risk right there. You're kind of, uh, dependent on the six, you know, polygon down members to make the correct decisions and you know in a you know something like uniswap it's it's way easier to get your asset whitelisted it doesn't take as much as it does on dystopia swap for sure but in a way it also can be a good thing having a kind of gated community of polygon dApps where um you know only trusted by trusted i mean you know the the, the code is completely audited and trusted and you know the biz the tokenomics and the entire model, the incentive design, all these different dApps have made make sense. And you can trust that because the Polygon DAO is kind of enabling these different dApps to grow, right? And Dystopia Swap is obviously influenced by the Polygon DAO. And I'm sure this was created in unison and these 26 dApps were agreed upon as the best for the Polygon ecosystem. Yeah, and so it's whether of... whether you it's whether you have faith in the polygon ecosystem. Yeah, or not. fair fair enough, right? But but I think that another thing that that this could do would be that let's say that dystopia only allows um a subset of tokens on or protocols on polygon to be able to list. Now you ha- as a user, then it becomes really annoying for me because I'm going to have to go on to dystopia for like, you know, some tokens, and then I'm going to have to go to another desk decks for other tokens. And then I'm going to have to go to, you know, uh, and, and then I just kind of want to aggregate all of that. So I think that if that is the model that's going to be built, there necessarily needs to be an aggregator built that incorporates tokens from dystopia swap and, you know, obviously trades them in the way that um, no, so it's already yeah. the Stupia swap has been integrated with uh, other aggregators okay, like one fine. inch. So makes sense. yeah, they've already, I mean, yeah, that makes complete sense to provide as, as many access points as possible to the dystopia swap decks, right? I mean, you, you have to do that. Uh, so yeah, they've done that as well. Um, so clearly they've, you know, they've kind of, they've not also, gone the not, traditional it's not, route. It's not, needed, it's not needed to optimize for all tokens. I mean, because of the design itself, which optimizes for the pools with most volume, the most trading, that will attract 
the most users anyway. And then the long right. tail, the smaller tokens. I mean, they don't need to optimize for it, but they already have their USP right there. Right, and so dystopia swap, they have both stable swaps where you know there are correlated assets, completely correlated assets like you know ETH and Wrapped ETH or Matic and Wrapped Matic, uh, which follows the curve stable swap model. So when an asset gets white, when a um, LP or uh, a liquidity pool gets created, it gets classified as a automatically based on so the assets that are already on dystopia swap are all white listed that includes matic and wrap matic and a li- when a liquidity pool is created it can automatically detect uh when an asset is when two assets are stable to each other or whether they're volatile to each other so if it's a stable swap it uses the stable swap mechanism and if it's volatile then it uses uniswap v2's aml model um so that's you know it's good in both ways because stable assets should should use a stable swap because you don't want slippage for you know trades as large as possible but on the extreme ends it happens in the stable swap model and uniswap v2 is much better for volatile assets even though there is risk of impermanent loss but that is a very known risk now also um in in your research did they mention anything uh, about you know how uh going forward token uh what do you call pool creation um how that looks uh for example and this goes back to the earlier conversation on the inherent centralization of uh, the DAO and its uh, power over choosing, you know, which assets get listed. But have they mentioned anything about in the future when, you know, naturally because of emissions, if their uh, stakes reduce, uh, then is there any model, for example, something like what we saw in Tokamak, right? How they have a voting system to decide, a community voting system that decides, okay, which are the next set of assets to be listed. Is there anything, uh, anything? Right. Like- so right now the Polygon DAO is it's in control of, you know, a majority of the disc out there, but in the future, they plan on having, um, essentially a new, a grants, a, a committee, every, not a grants committee, a committee every year that would change based on the VDIST holders voting for who they think should be the next, uh, who they think should be on the next committee. So the committee to decide upon which assets get whitelisted would be decided upon through a democratic system where we list holders can vote for who they think should be on the committee. So this would happen after Polygon's for your NFT lock gets over. Got it. So it's initially the first four years are things that don't scale essentially. And then once they've yeah. up to a certain level, then the more democratic systems and the more um yeah but i mean this is still abstract you know it's well. it's not been it's not been decided in code right this is all okay. Okay. according and to the people developing it and also it can end up being plutarchic as well like in the sense that the dApps that gain the most amount of volume um and fees over the next four years um will have the most amount of vdisc and therefore they can just vote for whoever they want really um to be on this committee Um, and you know, like, I mean, I, I, and like, I just like try to game out these extreme scenarios, but let's say that there's a, um, there's like a DAP that has got a significant amount of VDIS. And then in four years, there's another DAP that's, that wants to start on the Polygon ecosystem. And, um, you know, uh, it, it wants, it wants to get whitelisted onto dystopia. So, but then it, it turns out that it's a direct competitor of, one of these dApps with the most amount of VDIS and they are on the committee and then they veto it. And then what do you end up with? You end up with like a security council type right. situation. So that's, that's where we can go to my next point, uh, which is that uh, Dystopia Swap uh, has built, has inbuilt the bribe system that was created through Curve, Convex, and then Votium. Uh, so protocols can now bribe uh, VDIS holders to vote for their pools. Uh, they can do this inbuilt in Dystopia Swap. Uh, and then extending that dystopia swap also has uh, a yield optimizer the way you know curve has convex or uh, dystopia swap has a protocol called penrose where you can do exactly what you did with uh, curve and convex where you deposit your curve and convex and you get convex curve uh, and, you know all of that i mean i don't want to go into big details about it but basically Acquiring Penrose is a more efficient strategy already than acquiring this because acquiring Pen gives you, uh, I think it was five times the amount of voting power that one B list would get you. So yeah, so we've already 
uh, we didn't even know about dystopia swap but it's already gone to penrose you know it's yeah it's i mean of, it's the same type of model that we yeah. said that tokimak would also need to have someone on top of um, yeah. their protocol right in order to be able to um, yeah like tokimak would also need to have someone so um, it, it's the same kind of wars situation in which you're creating a war to hold as much v distant distant stuff yeah and i i think that i mean so curve and convex as protocols have not performed as good as you know other other aspects of the crypto industry but i feel like long term these are the defi protocols that will survive and kind of hmm. you know gain value over the long term instead of being it like short spurts of growth and then crashes according to you know what the new meta is in crypto like these are the true defi apps that have truly you know brilliant incentive and token design and are not just you know it doesn't matter whether there's hype around curve or not you know that curve will be there in the future because it is the best place to swap stables and it has the deepest liquidity and the best you know trading experience maybe yeah. not the best ui but you know it has the best slippage trading you know hassle free kind of experience yeah i i mean and i'm I not i'm still not like 100% convinced that this is like the best tokenomics model um like the one that we've the best discussed around we have so far right yeah um oh you talking about dystopia dystopia talking, talking about dystopia not curve okay. sorry I'm talking about dystopia in general because I feel like the um like because I feel like the happy path situation has been considered in in you know in most instances where you know everything is rosy and good and there's a positive flywheel but then um you know the, the it, it's that exact same problem about bootstrapping enough liquidity and network effects to keep users sticky on this dex and make mm-hmm. sure that they continuously hold v this and they continuously vote on these uh liquidity pools and the emissions and all of that and i think that that's an easier task said than done um especially you know given the you know like i mean imagine if you have to do the same kind of thing on every different blockchain that your dapp is deployed to um and uh, and, and you know like you like you have to do it on polygon you imagine you have to do it on solana imagine you have to do it on avalanche you have to do it on all of these different ones it gets impo- it gets very difficult for dapps especially um you know with the teams that they have to like continuously manage this type of liquidity and con- and, and play these kinds of games right um and 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 obviously like it's it's very important but i feel like this is we're still in like the very first innings um of this entire defi ecosystem and that's why we're seeing these kinds of protocols come up that have these that, that have these designs that are trying to reward longer term um you know holders and i think that's a pretty noble and good thing to do um i just think that like this is it's not necessarily you know i mean it's the best that we've got sure but it's not yeah i i don't know if that it's it, it means that it's likely to succeed going forward in the future just because of the negative flywheel effects um that that can happen because i mean it allows you to get users I, 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 the jury is still on out on whether it allows you to retain users so uh, right. so don't you don't you think that um you know the fact that i mean your point on the negative flywheel is fair but don't you think the fact that the team is targeting dapps as the primary customer here or the primary user um kind not, not completely mitigates you can never know if it completely mitigates but doesn't it reduce the ten, the chance of it the liquidity being mercenary um as opposed to if it's a, if it's a retail user yeah of course and i mean like that's that this I, i'm not saying that this isn't an improvement on what he, on what we've seen right because retail is much more likely to be mercenary and if if a liquidity provider is a dao is a v uh this holder of all, if all of those entities are you know the same and they're trying to bootstrap liquidity for their token then you're aligning incentives you know well enough and i think that that's that, that that's kind of the uh, a step in the right direction for sure so i i don't think that you know this model is doomed or anything but i just think that it it definitely um you know isn't bulletproof yeah right. and i think i think the the fact that they you know uh, i mean this is also to the broader uh, v model the fact that you Uh, have you know long term lockups um from a dapps perspective it helps right it helps it, them the team believing it and start and work towards a long term vision and at the same time it it basically eradicates the possibility of short term um you know mistakes of you know say they get scared or get pan- they panic during a market downturn and sell but if they just hold held on for a year or so which now they have to and the market recovers then you know they sail through a storm essentially right and that whole instance because the negative spiral like how we saw for 
for let's say um, Luna, it was caused by a, con- a, a confluence of factors, right? It wasn't because it, it couldn't just happen at any point in time. So if they are forced to pull through another set of factors, if it may arise in the future, then they essentially so- solve for the negative flywheel. Right. I mean, the only problem with that is what happens if there aren't enough trading fees, right? That's the Correct. that's the biggest. Like, that, if there's I, not I, enough trading fees, then 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 you can just assume in a way that the polygon ecosystem as a whole yeah. is not generating enough trading fees, which is, as I said, then you're if you're bullish on dystopia swap, you have to be bullish on polygon. So, 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 and so just the polygon like, yeah. ability to choose the DApps. Exactly. Exactly. They're, right. That, exactly. that I think becomes a very critical component. So, it, so yeah. So essentially what you're saying is that the, the base assumption is the best dApps on Polygon are on Dystopia Swap. If those dApps stop getting trading fees, then nothing on Polygon is really working. So that means, right. you know, like, you're okay, fine. I mean, like, I don't think that that's a poor assumption to make. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, to your um, broader point on, on, uh, liquidity being fragmented over blockchain i think i think that this is this uh this uh dystopia swap has not addressed at all and i don't think anyone's addressed um how you know fragmented liquidity is fundamentally you know the wrong way to go about it if you need the deep liquidity uh in in for, for low slippage so i don't think that i think that's a very valid point i don't think that's been addressed by this, this right. topic. and i mean at some point you know like i feel obviously we're in the very early stages of this ecosystem um, and that's why there's so much fragmentation in the different types of protocols and businesses that are coming about um, that are trying to solve problems all with a bit of a tweak on the um, on, on the method of its predecessor right um, and I feel like at some point there will be a lot of consolidation in in this space so like for example dystopia swap could merge with uniswap and um, you know a, a section of uniswap that you know like the the, the section of Uniswap that Dystopia Swap becomes is directed t- specifically towards gaining liquidity from the side of, you know, uh, DAOs or DApps or whatever. So, I mean, like that, that that kind of consolidation is necessary for the market because, I mean, like, okay, you know, we say a lot about, or oh, like, de- decentralization doesn't really mean um, no consolidation because the consolidation aspect is very important for user experience. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, like that's, I, I feel like overall, like that's what will end up happening or, you know, you'll just end up using aggregators with like these individual DEXs that are part of the aggregators getting abstracted out. Yeah. Right. So, so Yash, what has been the traction like? Right. So I was just going to get to that. So Dystopia Swap, it only launched uh, at the end of May. And since then it reached a high in TVL of uh, 28 million. And since then it it's decreased, but through a bear market, you know, it had gone to a low of around 10 million, but it's back up to around 17 million. So there's clearly, you know, traction on it. It's not the best traction I've seen. And, you know, if you compare it to other DEXs on other L2s that have the same model, and the main one I can think of is Velodrome, uh, the traction isn't that great. Um, so Velodrome, uh, Velodrome is also a much older DEX. It's been around since I think, 2019 or 2020 if i'm not wrong uh but velodrome has gone from you know you know end of july which is just a few days ago from 14 million in tbl to 126 million in tbl so i'm not sure exactly i've not researched it in detail but i know velodrome has the exact same or very similar model to dystopia swap where they have you know velo and then they have v velo nfts uh, but the only difference is that instead of giving airdropping it to you know taps equally, they kind of airdropped it subjectively, and you know the bigger, uh, more useful taps like Aave etc. were airdropped more than the smaller taps. That was pretty much the only difference. And Velodrome is built on optimism, uh, and Dystopia Swap is obviously yeah. built on Polygon. So I also think it's due to optimism recently dropping a token and there being a lot more traction on the optimism chain compared to or the optimism rollup compared to polygon which has been around for a long time and velodrome probably got marketed a lot better but still i have no idea why their tbl has 10 x in the last five days there's definitely another episode there and we probably you know maybe cover it in a future episode uh but yeah and uh Penrose, which is the convex for dystopia swap, it's at 13 million in TVL. Um, 
So mm-hmm. it had it was at a low of around seven million on the fifth of July, and it's you know since gone from seven to thirteen. So that has also doubled TVL in a month. But it's hard to judge whether all of these are to do with the big crypto crash and then the minor recovery that's happened after it because. You know, one in crypto, all of these graphs look kind of similar, all these TBR graphs. So it's hard to judge if it's organic traction or if it's just traction due to a reversal temporarily of risk sentiment. Right. And yeah, I mean, like it's, I feel like it's way too early to judge it, right? Sorry, when was it launched again? Um, this uh, so I think uh, emissions started going live on May 26th. Okay, so very so recently. Not that long like ago, right, yeah, very recent. And right in the middle of the crash, right? So I mean, you're not really right. going to be expecting an insane amount of traction. And the jury is, yeah. you know, definitely still out on that. Um, so I mean, yeah, like I, I don't think that in terms of like token performance or traction or anything like there must be too much to say just because it's so it's so new and you need like more data in order to be able to judge this more holistically yeah absolutely you just need you need more time honestly and see whether over time it's kind of growing the network whether there's more and more people holding you know have having uh, you know trades on dystopia swap and another thing that is very key to keep in mind is the total amount of uh, disks that is locked into VDisk. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's an interesting dashboard on Dune that's, you know, live. So currently the amount of disk locked is at around 73%, 74%. So according to them, so the way this works is that the more disk is locked up, the lower the amount of emissions there will be, which is very similar to curve. Um, so according to their projections, if 90% of this is locked up, they will be at around a hundred million total tokens, uh, out there circulating supply. So the initial uh, token supply that they airdrop to, you know, Polygon and all the dApps is 20 million. So they, according to their, uh, projections if 90% of that is locked up, then, you know, the 20 million allocated would only be 20% of the entire hundred million. But currently it's at 73%. And according to their projections, if only 70% of this is locked up, we'd be at around 300 million tokens totally. So a big difference there. And so we're currently in between that 70 and 90, but closer to the 70. So I would say maybe at this rate, we are going, we're looking at 250 million total tokens in the future out there circulating supply. But that's obviously variable and depends. Um, but that's just an indication of uh, you know, how successful it is at making sure people keep their disc locked up and continuing that flywheel effect. Because right. the more disc that's locked up, then, you know, the less there is out there. And if there's demand for that disc, then the price will go up. And that kind of continues the network effect where this becomes more and more valuable. But, yeah. really but at the same time, it gets balanced out. Yeah. But oh, by the opposite it, side, know, right? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. I mean, it's not, it's not magic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. This, this, uh, this, I'm not too sure, but this curve follow the same dynamic, uh, emission, uh, you know, uh, uh type schedule. Like this, schedule. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. It has an emission schedule, uh, and it's, it's, they're called curve emissions, right? It's, it's, no, but is, it, is it dynamic in, in, in the same way that how this is all dynamic based on the locked uh, this, so no, this... I think curve emissions are based on uh, on a set uh, schedule. There's a limited amount right. of curve right. released right. every right. week. I think so this is, big... yeah, this is, yeah, this is a big difference. So the, this is a kind of better in a way, I feel, because, but it can be worse, right? It's the same <laughs> thing. It can, yeah, I mean, yeah, tokens, just, yeah, like, I mean, token inflation is reduced if you lock up more disk, but if you don't lock it up, then like the token will get inflated away, which just, I mean, I guess that's Five, okay. kind of, that's kind of uh, incentive for you to lock it up paradoxically, yeah. right? Cause if you right. don't lock it up, your value will get diluted. Um, yeah. And if you it's lock like it it's up, endless, then less right? Value. It's just yeah. endless. You can be on both sides of the argument. It's, yeah. I think it just depends on the momentum at any given time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And which um, is kind of a tough way to analyze something fundamentally. Okay, cool. And, and in terms of, you know, um, did you end up using dystopia soap? Like what was your experience in using it? I mean, yeah, so I some... used it, but uh, I had actually read all about it. So I understood exactly what I was doing, but you know, for the layman to just go on dystopia swap, it would be a lot of yeah. 
jog in to take in yeah. in you know in like five minutes because so I don't think that's be this. Right to do and I don't think that's yeah. Right anyways, to do. I think anyways, dystopia swap is not geared towards the average <laughs> retail user. So I don't think that really matters. Yeah, that's a, but that's even a then point. it's it is like decently clean UI. You know, it's it wasn't like too complicated to it was I just had to go on MetaMask and a you know sign in through my wallet and you know obviously through the Matic network. And then it was very easy. I could just start doing whatever I wanted to do if I had Matic in my wallet. You just need yeah. Matic in your wallet and then you can swap to anything. Okay, makes sense. And I and I I guess like obviously this is geared towards Polygon and it's geared towards uh DApps anyways. Yeah. So people who are more experienced. So it doesn't need to be like, you know, uh uh it doesn't need to onboard a billion users, really. Exactly. Um, it's not it's I mean it's it's a it's like a hedge on the Polygon ecosystem, right? Do you believe that hmm. this can be as big as Curve is for Ethereum? And if Polygon will also you know, grow rapidly to become the premier L2 on Ethereum or will it not? Right. Okay. So, so let's let's just for, for one second. I mean, I'm trying to think this through as well. Um, like paint the bull case for the dist token, right? Um, that would look like that would look something like the apps that this the, the exchange picks are apps that um that attract a lot of trading volume to the exchange therefore there will be higher trading fees that, which will then um, if the tokens are locked up to vdist will accrue to vdist which will inherently accrue to the dist token itself eventually um, when you can when it unlocks and you can redeem it for dist if you choose to uh, not lock it again for another period of time and the, but and then the, the trading, trading fees themselves don't accrue to the dist token though yeah, I know. Accrues to VDIST holders. Exactly. It doesn't. But as a VDIST holder, you can always. The only way you can cash out is either you claim your rewards or you finally sell your VDIST for DIST in the future. So the VDIST that you lock in, when when you lock in DIST, let's say you lock in hundred DIST tokens and you get hundred VDIST, you know, an no, NFT get, worth hundred. Yeah. So that depends, right? If you lock it for the max, then you get a one is to one. And if you lock it for sure, less, you don't. Sure. Let, obviously. Let, let, let's assume for now that you lock it one is to one and you get an NFT worth 100 VDIS. Um, and then over time, your the trading fees accrue to that NFT and that NFT at the end of the lockup period is worth say 150. Is that how yeah. it works? And yeah, do the basically. trading fees accrue in, like what is the currency? Is it DIST? No, it's whatever the swap was done Okay. In. So whatever this swap yeah. is, met better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah. When, you, when you when your VDIST NFT unlocks, you then also have these other currencies in your wallet. Is it, yeah. is it like that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's only the pool you've voted for, right? You you're not just going to be random. It's going to right, be right, right. you have VDIST. You voted for specific right. pools, and so you're assuming the VDIST holder is a DAP that is voting for its own pool that it has also provided liquidity for. Yeah. Like that's the assumption I would make, right? It's not, you don't assume it's a retail guy who's just has some VDIST and wants to kind of see what to do with it. It, it would be a DAP. The DAP is providing liquidity on Dystopia Swap because they were initially airdropped DIST, uh, DIST, VDIST NFTs. So they have an incentive to provide liquidity and then they can also earn emissions on that liquidity they provided. And then they'll earn trading fees because they're VDIST holders and they'll also earn DIST as liquidity providers, which they can then sell or choose to lock up and gain modest and more trading fees in the future. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I think we've spoken about it quite a bit. Uh, I just want to, you know, before I, I say my closing statement, I just want y'all to say whatever your final thesis is on, you know, dystopia swap. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can go first. I think that um, it's an interesting and incremental improvement in DEX design in terms of the tokenomics. I feel like the tokenomics are interesting enough. I feel like the um, I, I feel like they are geared towards the correct kind of user um, that we, Dystopia Swap is meant for, and it's very important to uh, to underline that Dystopia Swap is for DApps and DAOs, and not as much as for uh, you know, retail users, which is why some of the experiences 
uh, of using dystopia swap need to be necessarily different to what we would have as a standard for retail users. So I feel like that's an that, that's an important point, and um, and dystopia swap does cater towards uh, you know those daps and dows and stuff. Um, I feel like there's uh, and and I do think that it's an important you know you can use it as a bellwether for how much you believe in the polygon ecosystem itself uh, because you know the best daps on it theoretically will be on dystopia swaps so you know more transactions um, include more trading fees equal to better uh, you know and and increase usage of dystopia swap but i feel like the 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 negative aspects are obviously that you're going to be assuming all of these things from a happy perspective um, and there are a lot of you know uh, and, and you know there's a lot of scope for this to fall flat on its face um it just in case that the 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 virtuous cycle or the you know the virtuous flywheel that you see in the positive direction it suddenly turns it he- turns its head and becomes negative so i feel like that's a that, that you know and l- like we spoke about before essentially right so I'm not going to go over that again but i feel like that's an important um you know uh, th- that's an important aspect to consider as well um uh, but overall i feel like you know i think dystopia swap is a uh, is a very interesting protocol to judge i don't think that it's um that you know the token itself is of really much the disk token for a retail user is of any use whatsoever um and the actual value is in vdisk um so from a retail perspective you know this this protocol can kind of um you know it can slip into the background a little bit because it's not really retail users apart from exchanging assets on dystopia swap um they have much to do with it but i feel like as a product for the dapps and daws that are building on these blockchains i think it's a it's a it's an interesting step in uh, the direction of providing a uh, you know a, a, a dex that is most aligned with the builders on a particular blockchain mm. Mm. absolutely i agree yeah, with yeah. that I, i think i think um I think this goes very well with the um, you know the analogy. I don't believe. I think it was Vitalik who said blockchains are like cities, right? And this is essentially like a national dex or trying to be a national dex of Polygon. Um, and I think I think the main um, innovation here is tokenomic, definitely. And they've obviously you know combined um, a lot of technical features in terms of you know stable swap, a uh, Uniswap model. um even convex right into one uh, one uh, or a dap but the tokenomics is definitely the main innovation here and i i i actually think it's quite interesting i think it's a very very worthy experiment and it's and the at the token distribution at launch almost makes it as a fair launch right and the only way for the founders to really accrue value is of course like if they're part of the dao then they have like a backdoor but um otherwise it's just by you know being liquidity providers and getting emissions and then you're know, following the regular path that they want to incentivize um so so i mean i i as as a as an so as a concept i love it um as an investment not financial advice but um so i mean i would i would just expect value to i mean i would expect one to value the token just based on the trading fees and just forecast trading fees and then do the regular old discounting um so that i think then it's very it's very easy to you know determine if you want to invest or not do you believe that so trading uh, you know trading will accrue to this debt if yes then maybe you you are positive if not then you're not i mean it's fairly straightforward in terms of a you know investment analysis perspective right i think you all said most of what i wanted to say in my closing statement um I just thought that this protocol was very interesting because it uh, innovated in a way I haven't seen recently in DeFi early. It was, and the way they decided to airdrop, you know, two different members of the Polygon ecosystem and kind of not airdrop or not have anything allocated to investors and the team and stuff like that. It truly seems like it was built for the entire Polygon community. This Dex, and I don't think I've ever seen that before for any other chain where you know the entire community. it seems is coming together to figure out the best possible model for their own dex for their own chain and kind of making it an even playing field for all the different dapps that are getting airdrop these tokens and having the polygon dao as the you know overarching i don't want to say ruler but i want you know overarching entity. person on top of everyone else overarching entity who 
does want this to succeed for their own ecosystem's own good, right? So, in a way, everyone's incentives are aligned, and it's not it's not you know common to see that in crypto where you do get close to great tokenomics design. So yeah, I really had a great time researching it, and I also. I mean, I think if you're bullish on the Polygon ecosystem, you have to be bullish on Dystopia Swap at this point. But do the names have to change? Yeah, what is yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it exactly conveys the best message to people who want to use it. But yeah, it's yeah, great. I, I, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, like the last thing. Sorry, I just wanted to touch upon the last thing that Sid said in terms of uh, in, in terms about uh, um sorry in terms of the um the value accrual of the DIS token itself for, you know, as an investment or anything like that. I don't, I'm not, a, I'm still not a hundred. I, I mean, I theoretically get how value is meant to accrue to the DIS token. I, I don't really, you know, practically think that there's any ways that we can currently model how that value is going to accrue the, to the DIS token in the future, because there's too many variables to that right now. Right. Um, so I feel like as an investment and again, obviously oh, this is not investment advice. Um, but you know, as an investment, I mean, like you don't want to touch this right now, especially if you're a retail user. I mean, why would you right? Like, it's just, sure. it, it's, it's, th there's still so many variables left up in the air um, that, you know, it's just, you just be punting on something that you have, you don't really have a complete clue about, and there's not enough data about that yet. Um, so unless you're like a complete, just like completely degening, um, it doesn't really, you it's know, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a VC bet, right? If you know the team, I mean, for retail, I agree with you totally, totally. But as a, as a, as, as a, if you zoom out as an investment, then it completely depends on if you know the team, you know how they're thinking through everything. And if you know the execution ability. Yeah, of course. And but yeah, from a, that's, but yeah. you're right. From a retail perspective with the lack of data we have, um, if at best it's a momentum trade, um, but that too also, you know, you, 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 you can't know. do moment. I mean, like doing a momentum trade is, I mean, like I wouldn't have, it's not my yeah, cup yeah. of tea. I mean, so right, this right. is, no, it's, it's not what we're enough. trying to do, right? Like it's not what we're trying to do yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to end that by saying the stupid swap is up 17% today. So <laughs> thank you guys. We're recording for that. on the 4th of August. That was great. Just uh, as context, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Well, yeah. Thanks everyone. Um, that right. was a great thank episode. Thank you Thanks everyone. So much, that was a great episode. Yes. Anytime, guys. Yes, thanks. Right. See you guys next time. Yeah. Bye.